Welcome back to the Poker Vlog. This is episode number 242. For this one, we're playing high stakes against the best poker players of all time, and that's not exaggeration. This is such an awesome episode, and uh, I can't wait to share it with you, but a couple of announcements first. Uh, we're doing the Lodge relaunch of our stream, February 17th through the 25th. We're going to be playing 50, 100, 200, 400, no limit. Uh, just massive, massive games with really some of the biggest names in poker. So uh, be sure to subscribe to the Lodge YouTube channel. I have a link down below in the description box. You won't want to miss that. And uh, I'm going to go over my year-end stats for 2022 at the end of this episode because this is the last cash game session that I played and um, I had just an amazing year. I can't wait to share that with you as well. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Just three days after busting out on day five of the WPT main event and getting my biggest payout ever of 99,600, we head back to the win for a cash game session in which I'll be putting nearly all of my recent winnings at risk in a 100-200 no limit cash game against the biggest legends in poker. I arrive at the cage at the same time as Phil Ivey. He has extra inventory on hand, so I agree to get my starting stack from him, and we'll square up afterwards. Yeah, I can just give you these chips, maybe. Sure. We basically borrow 80,000 chips from Ivy because he doesn't have a bag to hang on to the cash with. I was told that most players will be buying in for around 20,000, which is what I buy in for initially, it becomes clear right away, most players will not be buying in for that amount. I look two doors down for me and see a stack at 300,000. Down on our direct right, our opponent is buying in for 100,000. I tack another 10,000 onto our stack as if that'll really make a difference. Then finally, I add on for 10,000 more to begin the session with 40,000. The lineup consists of essentially the Mount Rushmore of poker. Doyle Brunson's on our left, Phil Ivey's on the right, and Phil Helmuth is the person two doors down from us who bought in for 300,000. Collectively, my neighbors have 36 total bracelets and over 70 million in career tournament earnings. If someone had told my 20 year old self that in my 30s, I'd be playing high stakes poker against this group, there's no way that I would have believed it. It's hard for my brain to even process what's happening right now. My first time playing poker against Helmuth was 12 years ago. I was 22 years old at the Lucky Chances card room just outside San Francisco. He brought David Lee with him, who just recently been traded to the Golden State Warriors. I snuck this pick to document the experience. My second time playing against him was at the Rio in 2017. I'd asked through a mutual contact if Helmuth would be willing to come play a 2-5 session for the vlog before my channel had gotten big or really had much traction at all. Without any hesitation or real benefit for Helmuth, he agreed to do it, and that video quickly became the most viewed poker vlog at that time. It currently has over 2.6 million views. Since then, we've always had a good relationship. I asked him in one other instance to do something for charity with me, and he immediately agreed. While some people detract him for his antics at the poker table, I always have a lot of respect and positive things to say about Helmuth. He's not the only legend here who I have good memories with. I played high stakes poker with Ivy once before when I had my biggest cash game win ever for 48,000. The last conversation I had with my dad was actually about that day. Ivy has ice in his veins, and is just about the coolest person to ever be dealt a hand at poker. Finally, we get to Doyle, who I also played high stakes with once before from my first ever televised cash game session that was filmed in May of 2022, and it's just now airing on Bally Sports. Super System was one of the first books that I read, but I enjoyed reading his autobiography, The Godfather of Poker, even more. If it wasn't for Doyle, I may have never had the opportunity to play this game for a living. He's done more than anyone to grow it into what it is now. While I've played with each of these legends once or twice before, it's extremely special to have them together on the same felt as me all at once but make no mistake, I'm here to win. To round out the rest of the lineup, WPT main event winner and cash game specialist Emma Zazmovich is here, and three-time NBA All-Star Gilbert Arenas has a seat as well. I have to give Gilbert credit for taking a seat. It's no cupcake table. He's the only one who's not a pro poker player. I certainly wouldn't feel very inclined to enter his domain and play one-on-one -on -one basketball against him for tens of thousands of dollars. Doyle in his prime might have, though. That's great. This guy played basketball a little bit. Yeah, he said, yeah. It's cool for me to get a smile out of Doyle a few minutes into the session after citing a fact that few are aware of, but Doyle was almost a professional basketball player. In the 50s, the Minneapolis Lakers showed interest in him, and Doyle likely would have played for him if it hadn't been for an injury that changed his path and the course for poker. Just four hands into the session, Helmy picks up pocket tens under the gun. He calls for 200. We look down at ace three suited in the cutoff, though the RFID reader doesn't pick up the ace. I raise to 800. Gilbert calls in the small blind with Jack-4, 
I once saw this hand win a pot of $269,000 without making a pair on two runouts. It was incredible. Emma has pocket eights in the big blind. She makes the call. Helmuth isn't going anywhere. He calls. We're going four ways to the flop in position. The dealer puts out ace, queen, deuce, all clubs. Now remember that we've got the ace of hearts, so we flop top pair, but with three other opponents, I'm not feeling great about it, especially with no kicker. We're actually drawing near dead. He checks to me. I check back immediately so that maybe we can get to showdown as cheaply as possible. The turn is the eight of diamonds giving Emma a set. Gilbert flopped a flush and can't allow more free cards to come out. Gilbert bets 3,500, which is slightly more than the pot. Emma has a strong hand with room to improve. She calls, even with me and Helmuth behind her. This gets my attention. Helmuth folds. Even after checking back flop, concealing the strength of our hand, I don't get the sense that ace three hearts is good with the action on the turn so far. I fold and get away completely unscathed. The river is another queen pairing the board and giving Emma a full house to take the lead. It's extremely unfortunate for Gilbert given the fact that I was holding one of Emma's outs. Gilbert somehow finds the check, so maybe he can get out of this relatively unscathed as well. There's 10,400 in the pot. Emma overbet jams for 15,000 effective. This is just a few minutes into the session. Gilbert is already put in a ridiculous spot after flopping the second nuts, having his opponent go run a runner for a boat. This is a disgusting hand. Gilbert understandably calls and gets the bad news. Right away, he gets stacked to kick off the session. What'd you have? I had tens. <clears throat> I had ace three of hearts. Well, that's it for me. It's absolutely brutal for Gilbert. It's a good reminder that anything can happen and I could easily lose tens of thousands of dollars quickly myself, particularly in this lineup and particularly because the one person I had a clear edge on is now out. I'm looking around, feeling like I'm about to be lunch for a bunch of gold bracelet and WPT main event winners. At least in the meantime, I get a front row seat to watch Doyle repeatedly fire massive river bets against Helmuth. You see in this case, Doyle has complete air and rips it for 25,000 into a pot of 20,000. He gets Helmuth to fold top pair here to win a huge pot. Then a few hands later, Doyle overbets River again for five figures, but in this instance, he has it for two pair. Helmuth makes the fold once more, this time he does so correctly. The cards aren't tabled in either hand, so I'm not aware what Doyle is making these plays with, but I strongly suspect that he didn't have it both times, indicating that even though he's almost 90, he still has it in him to make some big moves. I'll remain vigilant. With the game being tough, 26 bracelets understandably take a break while waiting for an alternate to arrive, so I'm playing three-handed with Doyle and Emma for a bit. Emma limps in the small blind. We check our option with a7 offsuit from the big blind. We're heads up in position. The flop comes queen seven deuce rainbow. It's very dry. We've got middle pair with a strong kicker though. Emma bets 200 into 600. We're not in the business of folding pairs while we're playing shorthanded poker. I call. The turn is the four clubs. It seems decent. We still have second pair. Emma ramps up the aggression with about 800 into 1,000. Having middle pair reduces the likelihood that we're up against really strong hands, like two pair of sets. I'm not totally buying that our opponent has a monster. I call, thinking that Emma might have a hand like 6-5 or 5-3 some percentage of the time. One pair of hands containing a 4 would probably check it over to me for pot control since she wouldn't necessarily need to turn third pair into a bluff on the turn. She'd probably just want to get the showdown as cheaply as possible with it. The river is another 4. This doesn't slow down Emma at all. I'm just gonna follow through with a third barrel. I like this a lot. Like a bar or something. Just something with a little bit of energy. But I'm, She's I'm got one of the worst hands she will ever reach the river with. She certainly can't win at showdown. So not never a bad time to bluff when you absolutely have no shot at winning at showdown. How far is it? And Brad's just got one of those classic tough decisions. Emma's going to have some good hands here. She's going to have some bad hands. I'm in the blender, but I pretty much ruled out Emma having a 4 on the turn, so it's unlikely she has trips. She could have a queen, or she could have a boat. Other than that, it's going to be bluffs. We're playing three-handed poker, and it's hard to make a boat, although Emma did make one earlier. Well, it's hard to make two boats. We're facing nearly a pot-sized bet, and we make the tough call before a small mouse is let loose on the set. Yeah, Brad finds Don't a call. Don't let them take it away. No, no. Very well done by him. I will. The ace kicker is a particularly nice card to call on the river with because it's not blocking any of the possible bluffs that Emma could have. <laughs> Emma does her best Phil Helmuth impression. She's a tough opponent, but she's one of the most fun people to have in a cash game. I'm having a good time too as I cross over the even mark for the first time today. A while later, we're five-handed again as Ivy raises to 600 from the button. 
we look down at ace-10 offsuit in the small blind. We can call or three bet. I call to play a hand against my favorite poker player growing up. We're heads up out of position. The flop comes jack-10 deuce with two diamonds. We've got middle pair and some backdoor draws. Ivy just has queen high. I check. Ivy has a handful of chips. He bets 1200 as if it's pocket change. Phil Ivy going with the big bet here. In my head, I'm wondering if we call now, how much is Ivy going to make it on future streets? I'm envisioning Ivy bluff shoving on the river and being in a nightmare situation. Still, I try not to get too far ahead. There are plenty of cards that can help us on the turn. I call, hoping mostly for a 10 or a diamond. The dealer puts out the three of diamonds, giving us more ways to win the hand. I'm feeling much better picking up the draw with a blocker to the nuts. My mood changes as I contemplate Ivy betting the river, us missing our flush draw, then potentially bluff shoving. Again, we don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. I check. Ivy still has chips in hand, just evidently not enough. He reaches for more and fires another big bet, this time for 3500 with nothing but the 4 high flush draw. He's trying to push us around like he has with so many others for decades. We're not folding, and there's no real need for us to turn our hand into a bluff given that we have showdown value and can still improve to the nuts. I call to see the river. The dealer puts out another 3, we don't get there. I almost immediately check in a much more exaggerated way than I did on the previous streets. I'm hoping this will look suspicious to Ivy as if I'm feigning weakness, but really I have something strong. Basically, I'm trying to mimic recreational players who probably tried to check raise Ivy in a similar manner a million times with the absolute nuts. You see Ivy looking over to process how I'm moving. Maybe this gesture will make him concerned that we've got a monster so that he'll check back. I really don't want to see him bet something like 15,000 because that sizing will handcuff us and we won't even be able to bluff raise. We'd have to either hero call or fold. If Ivy bets anywhere around pod or less, there will be some room for us to bluff jam, repping either the ace high flush or a hand like tens full of threes which we have removal for, as well as aces, ace jack, and jack ten. Our emphatic check might just have accomplished our goal of freezing Ivy to allow us to get to showdown the least nerve wracking way possible. And that is probably not the most exciting river for Phil to bluff and he does check back really quickly so. Whether or not the way that we checked actually affected Ivy's decision, I guess we'll never know, but it definitely didn't hurt. We got the quick check back and a pot of $11,000 with second pair. It's a solid win that keeps the confidence high while playing against Poker's Elite. Next, the $400 straddle's on. I'm in the big blind with Jack Deuce offsuit. I'm getting four and a half to one and can't really fold anything. I call for 200 more. Doyle checks his option. We're heads up out of position. The flop comes Jack 4-3 rainbow. We both got a pair. I make a very small wager of 300. It's about a quarter of the pot. Doyle calls with two threes. The turn is the 10 of hearts. I check for pot control and Doyle checks back quickly. He probably doesn't have top pair or a draw or else he might have considered betting for value or semi bluffing. The river is the jack of hearts giving us trips. The backdoor flush gets there. That really isn't a concern though, especially after seeing the quick check back from Doyle on the turn. We're gonna be betting big for value. I bet 1400 into 1700 to target a hand like the one that Doyle has to see if he'll try to keep us honest. Doyle isn't quite sure what to make of it. He's probably thinking that if I had a jack, I might have bet all three streets rather than check the turn. There are also fewer combinations of jacks that I could have now that two of them are on the board. He's just not completely buying that we have as strong of a hand as we do. Doyle looking to do something heroic here. This is not, not going to be the time for it. We get a hero call from one of my heroes to win a pot slightly under 5,000. Just to be able to tangle with Doyle a little bit is pretty awesome for me. And this one straddles on again. Ivy's in the hijack and raises to 1,300. He's got ace-9 suited. We wake up in the cutoff with a premium. Our ace-king offsuit is best at the moment. We 3-bet to 4,000. Ivy calls for 2,700 more. We're playing nearly a $9,000 pot in position against someone who's both arguably the best poker player of all time and maybe the third best poker player at the table. The flop comes 10-6-3 rainbow. Neither of us have much. Ivy checks. It's not a flop that'll be all that great for us very often, and Ivy can still have some sets, over pairs, or top pair. I check back for pot control. The turn is the four of hearts. It's another card that typically won't help me. Ivy elects not to take a stab at it, thinking that he has at least some showdown value with his ace high. I check back again. Our hand is really face up now. The river is the deuce of diamonds. Neither of us are too excited. We both check one final time. Phil says that he has ace high. We spare him by showing first since we have the best ace high. This isn't too exciting about hand post flop, but in every one of these battles, my heart is racing a thousand beats per minute. Nine thousand dollars isn't much to these other players. It's a lot of money to me though. We've gotten off to a strong start being just one of two people in the black as we finally pick up a sixth player. 
Brian Ercolano, who's a wealthy businessman with plenty of poker experience under his belt. We pick up King Six suited on the button shortly after Brian's arrival. I raise to a thousand. Brian's in the big blind with seven six suited. He calls. Emma's in the straddle. She defends for six hundred more. We're going three ways to the flop, and we all catch a big piece. Ooh, look at this flop. Wow, Emma with top pair, backdoor flush draw. Brad with two pair. Brian with bottom pair and a flush draw. And Brad's betting big. This, this could really turn into something. I bet big because we smashed the flop, we're up against multiple opponents, and there are several draws out there. The only real hand that I'm worried that might have us beat right now is king-queen. We would have gotten three bet pre-flop by pocket kings or queens, and there's only one possible combo of pocket kings and pocket sixes that our opponents could have anyway. Brian has a hand that he could check raise with, but I made a large bet. He has plenty of equity, so he doesn't necessarily have to turn his combo draw into a bluff. He just calls. Emma has an interesting decision with her top pair, no kicker. She has only 5% equity, and that's basically all coming from her backdoor heart draw, since another three won't really help her. If she had king three of clubs, she'd probably fold. She calls one time to see if she can improve. With two opponents, it's very likely that at least one of them has spades, more so since we know where a lot of the kings and sixes are. The turn is the five of spades, giving Brian a flush and 95% equity. He checks, Emma checks, there's a nightmare for us. I realize we're probably behind and drawing slim. I check back. The river is the ace of spades, putting four to the flush on board. It's gone from bad to worse. However, no one likes this card, including Brian, who checks. Emma gives up her attempt to steal the pot. She checks. I check back immediately. Brian turns over his flush. We get less than an ideal run out, but do well to avoid losing much money. Nice execution there by Brad. He gets in as much money as he can while he has the best hand. Unfortunately, sometimes the best execution doesn't mean you get to win the pot. Here we've got 7-6 suited in the cutoff. I raise to 1,000. Helmuth defends his straddle for 600 more. We're heads up in position. The flop comes 8-3 deuce with two clubs and a diamond. It's not a terrible flop for us since we have a lot of backdoor draws. Plus, we have removal for hands like 8-7 and 8-6 suited. Helmuth checks. I don't expect him to connect with the flop all that often, and our hand has no showdown value at the moment. I bet 800 is a bluff. Phil puts in a tiny check raise to 1800. To his credit, it puts me in an annoying spot because we're getting 5 to 1 pot odds. It doesn't seem like he's that strong when he makes this move. There are lots of cards that can help us improve, including diamonds, and he 10, 9, 5, or 4 as well. I call one time with plans of likely turning our hand into a bluff at some point if an opportunity becomes available. The turn is the 3 of clubs. Phil may be worried that we hit the flush. He checks. I was mostly hoping for a card that would help us improve, or at least a high card that we could potentially use as a bluff. I check back. The river is the four of clubs, giving Helmuth a nine high flush. He checks once more, so it's unlikely that he likes his hand too much. There's a very good chance that he doesn't have a club after checking on both the turn and the river, but we can rep one. I bet 2,000. It's a small bet just to fold out all hands Helmuth might have that doesn't contain a club. Unfortunately for us, Helmuth does a club check and finds he indeed has one in his hand. He calls. We lose an extra couple thousand. The game has basically become twice as big with the straddles on every hand. And now that I've lost a few, I'm down slightly below even for the session. Two hands later, it's my turn to straddle to 400. Doyle raises to 900. Ivy calls in the big blind for 700 more. With a hijack open and big blind call, we're mostly supposed to 3-bet squeeze ace-10 offsuit from the straddle. We find it and we raise to 4,000. Doyle has a real hand that he's happy to see a flop with. He calls. Ivy has air and folds. We're heads up, out of position against one of three players at the table with 10 or more bracelets. The flop comes 9-5-4, giving Doyle top set. This is a recipe for disaster in another 9k pot. Doyle opened from early position and called a 3-bet, so I'm worried that if we see bet we won't get many folds, and Doyle could potentially be strong on this board, whereas we'll almost never have anything better than one pair. I check. Doyle is loving life even more than usual. He bets 3,000 to milk us. I don't see a great path for us to win this from out of position. I fold and at least avoid losing more than what's necessary. Brad decides to check. I like it too. And he is going to be very happy that he made that decision. Little does he know just how big of a hand Doyle had there. Things aren't going too poorly, but they're not going all that well either. We see on the leaderboard that I'm down a little bit. Doyle's about even, he's only stuck 1600, then just a few minutes later, Doyle loses a couple hands in a row and is down over 20,000. When we're playing 100, 200, 400 with a $200 big blind Annie, that isn't much, but 
I get the sense that Doyle's getting a little flustered when we look down at pocket 10s in the cutoff. I raised to 1,000. I just added on for 15,000, so I'm in for 55,000 total on the day, but the chip count to the left of my name hasn't been updated yet. I started this hand with about 52,000 in front of me. Doyle initially bought in for 40,000. He only has 19,000 of that remaining. He three bets to 4,000. It folds back to me. I need to get a count of exactly how much Doyle has left. Stack sizes are really awkward. If I call, the pot will be 9,000 and Doyle will only have 15,000 total. There are just four pocket pairs better than ours, but there are a lot of flops that won't be good for us. I really don't want to fold. I also don't want to call and see the flop come king, queen, or jack high, then I have to wonder if we're good either. You see me in the moment looking as if I'm trying to calculate how much rocket fuel it would take to get us to the moon. What I'm really thinking about is how many big blinds a shove for 19,000 effective would be. With the straddle to 400 on, it's less than 50. It's a little more than I'd really like to gamble, but I told you earlier, those hands Doyle played against Helmuth caught my eye and made me realize that he's still willing and able to make some plays. Those hands, coupled with the fact that I know Doyle stuck more than half of his initial buy-in, makes me think it's more likely than usual that Doyle could be trying to make me his newest victim, and perhaps he's three betting us light. Maybe if I four bet jam, I can get some hands like ace-jack or ace-queen to fold. If not, I'm okay getting it in as a flip against ace-king. I just really don't want to jam and get snap called. I announce that I'm all in, and somehow we do get snap called. I figure we gotta be up against aces or kings. Nope. We're up against Ace Jack suited, which I would have expected Doyle to fold because this is about the best case scenario for him when he calls, but Doyle's apparently in the gambling mood. We're flipping in a $40,000 pot against the most important person in poker's history. As badly as I'd like to win this pot, I owe Doyle a lot more than what's in the middle, so I wouldn't be too disappointed to lose. The flop comes Queen 9 7 with two diamonds. We've got the 10 of diamonds, which could come in handy. I'm thankful that I didn't just flat the 3 bet pre flop because. I wouldn't know what to do if I checked, and Doyle shoved. My eyes are glued on the run out since this is one of the biggest pots of my life, and it's against one of my idols. Meanwhile, Ivy's having a tough time staying awake. The Queen of Diamonds comes on the turn, getting us one step closer to the win, and removing two of Doyle's out since we pick up the flush draw. The river is the eight of spades, giving us the victory and adding 20,000 Doyle dollars to our stack. Brad holds, that is, that is a nice pot right there. This is a hand that Doyle will probably forget before he falls asleep tonight, but it's one that I'll certainly always remember. I have so much respect for all these guys. To be sitting at the same table and competing against them is something that's incredibly special. To be at five figures after winning an all-in against Doyle is beyond what I could have hoped for. This is the coolest moment in two decades of playing poker. Doyle would rebuy, then only stays for a little bit longer before heading out. It was a pleasure playing with him. I still need to remain focused though. We're playing four-handed at the moment, Helmuth limps in from the small blind. We're in the big blind with queen eight offsuit and check. The flop comes king queen eight rainbow. We've got bottom two pair. Helmuth checks. We actually make over a pot size bet of 1,000 into 600. If we get called, our plan is to just fire big on each street. Helmuth makes the call. I put him on a king or a straight draw. The turn is the deuce of clubs. It's as blank as it gets. Helmuth checked dark before the turn came out. I bet 2,000. It's an amount Helmuth is okay with. He calls. The river is the five of hearts. Phil checks as soon as he sees it. We would have gotten check raised by anything better than our hand, so we're either up against air or top pair type of hand. I announce an overbet of 7,000. There's nothing for Phil to do other than fold. We take down a nice pot though. This win gets our stack up to about 75,000 as Ivy departs. The graphics for my stack is incorrect because they still haven't added the 15,000 to it that I added on for, but the profit amount is accurate. We're having a good day. Brad has slowly made a very tidy profit on the game. Well, he did win that flip earlier, but probably not a good idea. That he was losing pots for a little really while. He's definitely climbed first. back, and I think he's about peak profit right now. We're looking to add to the peak profit. We call for 100 more in the small blind with King 10 offsuit. Ryan checks his option. We're heads up out of position. The flop comes Ace Queen Jack with two diamonds. We flop the straight. What's better is that we're up against top pair. I check to the in position player. He bets 200. With three Broadway cards out there and a limped pot, I don't expect that we're up against two pair better very often. It's likely that the opponent is drawing close to dead. I don't want to scare him off if that's the case. I just call the 200. The turn is the deuce of spades. I love seeing it. I check again. This time, Brian makes nearly a pot size bet of 900. His top pair will be the best hand the majority of the time. I happen to have one of the few strong hands that I'll ever have on this board. We have to start trying to build this pot up because I'm concerned that if I call a large bet on the turn, Brian will probably check back almost all river cards. 
because it's so unlikely they'll all be strong, I choose a big raise size of 4,000. I want to make sure that we're appropriately charging combo draws as well since we don't have any diamonds in our hand. Unfortunately for us, Brian's pair is pretty easily drawing dead or slim. He can't justify making a call as a bluff catcher. Instead, he makes a good fold. We're on a roll now though. We're up over 23,000 on a session against Goliaths. The old viral comes in as an alternate for Ivy. He buys into the game for half a million dollars to start. Even with the graphics finally getting sorted out for us, we still have less than one sixth that amount in front of us as we raise the 600 with Jack 10 of hearts. Helmuth calls in the small blind with a hand that doesn't have us in great shape. We're heads up in position. The flop comes King Queen 3 Rainbow. We've got the straight draw with backdoor flush possibilities on a board that will more often than not favor us as the pre flop aggressor. Helmuth checks. We're drawing to the nuts and can pretty much get all the pocket pairs from 10s down to 4s to fold with a bet. I fire for 700 as a semi bluff. Helmuth is going nowhere with his top pair. He cuts out chips quickly and makes the call. The turn is the deuce of spades. Helmuth immediately checks as it comes out. We've got air, but perhaps we can get a hand like Queen Jack or Queen 10 to fold this juncture if we bet. We can have hands like sets of kings and sets of queens on this flop that Helmuth won't have. I bet 2,000 to keep the pressure on, not anticipating getting check raised almost ever. Helmuth throws a wrench in that plan with a min raise to 4,000. If he had a two pair or better hand, I would have expected a bigger sizing. We're getting four and a half to one on the call, so we're getting about the right pot odds to stick around, especially when considering any implied odds that we may have if we drill a nine. We call for 2,000 more. The river is the five of spades. We brick, but the backdoor flush draw gets there. Helmuth is concerned that we could have a flush, aces, ace king, or something else that beats him. He checks. We've got the worst hand that we'll ever have. We played it like we had a draw on the turn. Then the best draw got there. We don't even beat ace jack or ace 10 if that's what Phil might have put the check raise bluff in with. I still get the sense that we're up against a one pair hand like a king or a queen. We'll have to bet a decent amount to get a king to fold. I'm gonna fire big. 9,000. Having only jack high and some of the draws making it, Brad will feel compelled to bluff this river. I like this bluff. I don't even know if I can take it anymore. It would be nice to have a spade, but it is the type of board where it's somewhat difficult for Brad to have bluffs. Most likely his only bluffs to choose from are jack 10. Perhaps he has a little bit of ace jack, ace 10, but those may even just check and see showdown. So nice execution here by Brad. Whether or not it works, we're going to find out. Phil is feeling the heat, so he unzips that jacket as he's put to the test. He knows that he really doesn't beat anything that I'd be betting for value. He has a pure bluff catcher if he wants to call. The thing that I have going for me is that I haven't shown down any big bluffs so far today, so my image is really solid. The bad thing is that Phil is stuck a good chunk, making him perhaps more likely to call, and by this time, he's aware that Doyle bluffed him earlier for quite a bit. He likely doesn't want to get bluffed twice on stream in fairly large pots. This is a situation which, if you're Phil, you prefer to have a spade in your hand so that there are fewer combos that I could have like Ace Jack, Jack 10, or Jack 9 of spades. I'm doing my very best not to give anything away as I'm putting on one of the biggest bluffs that I've ever put on anyone, and it's the man with more accolades than anyone else in poker. He doesn't want to let go. Phil does find the call. Wow. He's going to be very happy. Fuck, I couldn't, I couldn't see imagine the best a hand, hand I could beat, so I kept saying to myself, Stop imagining, because you can't beat anything. Just decide whether he has it or not. How's the divity? <laughs> After five and a half hours of running it up, Helmuth makes a difficult call, causing us to lose over half of our profit. I'm frustrated that the bluff attempt didn't get through. Helmuth's min check raises have been my crib tonight. To make things tougher, Dan Smith takes a seat on my direct left. He's truly one of the top cash game players in the world at the moment. With the unsuccessful bluff attempt weighing on me, and game conditions getting worse, I decide it's time to rack up and book a nice profit after battling with poker's all-time best players. After I give 80,000 in chips back to Ivy's contact, I head to the cage and cash out the profit. I won 8,700 today. Um, got to play against Helmuth, Ivy, Brunson, so, uh, just complete legends in the game. Awesome, awesome day. Um, overall, bluffed off, you know, 9K at the end to Helmuth. I think that uh, some of the time he folds there, but didn't work out that time. Uh, the game got tougher with Dan Smith on my left. 
and uh, so figured it was a good time to rack up since I was kind of annoyed at myself a little bit that the bluff didn't get through and uh, but just awesome day overall. That's it for this one guys. I hope you enjoyed it. This was just the coolest poker session that I've ever played. I got to play with uh, three of the all-time best poker players that have ever lived. So uh, if you if you like this episode, please hit the like button. And if you haven't subscribed yet, definitely um, subscribe. This was just such a cool moment for me as a giant fan of poker. And uh, I never envisioned myself ever being in a lineup with any of those guys, let alone all three of them. I have to be one of the few people to have ever played with all three of them at the same time. So that was something that was really special. Um, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to let me know in the comments section. I'm happy to get back to you. <clears throat> Jeez. I'm happy to get back to you. Uh, let's see here. We've got that uh, Lodge relaunch. Um, we're relaunching the stream February 17th through the 25th. I'll be playing 50, 100, and 200, 400 throughout the week. So just huge games. I've never actually played any, any session with the blinds at 200, 400, and there's gonna be straddles on and double straddles. These pots are going to be massive, and I'm actually a bit concerned about it, but um, should, be, should, be, should be pretty cool, and hopefully I can come out uh, without getting just absolutely torched, but uh, we're putting a lot at risk. Um, as promised, I'm gonna go over the stats for 2022 because this was the last cash game session of the year for me. And uh, I had a phenomenal year, one that I, I, I just had the best year by far of my life. So let's go ahead and get into that. First, we're gonna look at overall stats. I won $248,829 over 730 hours about. It says that I was profitable a little over 56% of my sessions. The reason why that number is lower it, than, than uh, normal, usually usually that number for me is around like 65 to 70%. Um, that's because I, I, I win a very high percentage of, of cash games. But the reason why it's lower this year is because I played a lot more tournaments. And so this is cash games and tournaments. The profit per hour is $340.99. I mean, that's just an absurd hourly. And a lot of these numbers are gonna be skewed because I had just an amazing tournament year this year. So uh, in 2019, I posted my stats. I made a video about it and I won $1,000. That was the worst year that I've ever had in my poker career. Even when I went broke uh, in 2012, I had a better year than that, but I just couldn't cover my expenses. So it's it's nice to have um, just my best year ever. Last year, I won around $65,000 over six or 700 hours or something. Um, so to, and that was really my best year of, of uh, playing poker before this one. So I just had some huge tournament scores. It was actually like the first year since making the vlogs that I had like a profitable tournament year. And I kind of had to always say in previous episodes when I would go through my stats that all it takes is like one big tournament score and you know, that'll that'll turn things around, blah, 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 blah. Um, so it's nice to finally have, you know, some big tournament scores and, and actually kind of multiple ones. I think I had five or six of my biggest tournament scores ever. And a lot of that is because I started playing higher buy-in. So previously I would play a lot of like 1Ks and 1500s and you're not really all that deep. Uh, I definitely ran better this year, but I played a lot of tournaments that were three to 10Ks and you start a lot deeper and they play a lot more like cash games on day ones and day twos. And so I've, I'm a good cash game player and I even got more coaching this year from Nick Petrangelo for the Smash Live Cash Course with Upswing, and I became an even better cash game player, and that definitely transferred over to some success in tournaments. All right, this this overall profit, by the way, I actually did better. Um, I made probably another seventy to a hundred thousand uh, dollars, mostly in cash games because I sold a lot of action whenever I had my biggest wins and. I didn't sell action when I had some of my biggest losses, and you'll see that. This is the chart. 
you see that big, big uh, uh, increase in, uh, in profit there at the very end. That is the $99,000 score I had at the WIN WPT World Championship uh, main event. So that's obviously going to skew things in the right direction. But before that, I was still up around $160,000 um, total for the year. Okay, now this is all venues based on profits. Win obviously did, did extremely well there in the tournament. Hard Rock Tampa, I had two 20K scores there. So that was pretty cool. And then the Poker Ghost Studio, you see the $34,600 profit. That's when I played a 5K and I got fourth in it uh, for 58,500, but the 34,600 amount is just the percentage that I had of myself. All right, and we see the lodge total profit. I think this is, yeah, this is a profit by location. You see the lodge, I only won 3,400. We'll get into that a little bit later and I'll talk about why that isn't a higher number, but I played 175 hours at the lodge, which is, I believe where I played the most hours out of anywhere, despite living in Las Vegas. So I traveled a lot, went to uh, went to Austin quite a few times last year, and I'll do the same this year. We also see the WPT stream for 24,000. That's when I played against Ivy, Magnus Carlson, uh, Alexander Botez, and uh, a couple other gamers. I talked about that session in this episode. Um, I actually won $48,000 in that session, but I only had half of myself, so you only see $24,000 in profit here. All right, now this is just my cash game profit, so I won 68,500, and uh, I it, this number should be higher, but I'll show you why it's not. This is the graph. You see there's a steep decline around session number 80. That's when I lost $30,000 on the stream at the lodge, which was brutal. Like I mentioned earlier, I typically had uh, less than all of myself when I had my big wins this year, and I had all of myself in my biggest losses of the year. I think I had like three or four of my biggest losses of all time um, this year, but that's just gonna happen when you're playing higher stakes, and uh, you know, it's, it, as long as you're having your biggest wins at the same time, then um, that's not anything to really be concerned about necessarily. But I did get a good chunk of it back towards the end of the year in cash games. Still would have been nice to win over $100,000 just in cash. All right, so these are the venues based on how I did in cash. You see Bellagio, I played 108 hours and did pretty well there. That's probably where I played the second most amount of hours this year. And then we'll go over to tournaments. I won $180,000 in tournaments this year, which is phenomenal. Played 37 sessions and I cash in a ridiculous 38% of them. Now, this is a little bit skewed in, in, in a couple different ways. One is that I got some free buy-ins from WPT. So that, so there's about 20K in buy-ins that, um, aren't included in here. So my profit would really be 160,000, but also there are three satellites that I won on uh, online for 37,000 that's also not included in here. So my profit would be a little bit higher. And then also I didn't have all myself in each of these tournaments that I did well in. So I probably, I know that I cash for like 200 and, $80,000 this year and I probably played plus the plus the three satellites for another 37,000 and I probably played about $100,000 worth of buy-ins. All right, here is the tournament chart and you just see that I had uh, I had just just you know, that giant score at the end of the year which um, caused the profit to go way up at the end, but still it would have been a great year. So when you see when you see some of those um, 
Some of those lines where they're just flat across, those are some of the WPT vines that I bricked, but were, uh, were paid for from my WPT brand ambassador deal. So there weren't really that many of those anyway that I didn't cash in. I just cashed in an absurd amount of tournaments. And then you see before like the 25 session mark, um, a lot of those are WP, a lot of that is like WPT time and I didn't have a profitable, sorry, a lot of that is WSOP time and I didn't have a profitable WSOP. Okay, so these are my tournament stats. You can see the win, did really well there. Tampa and the Poker Go studio, I already kind of mentioned those locations and then the WSOP, you see that I lost $14,000 during the summer and uh, I lost another thousand at the lodge in in tournaments. I think I only played two tournaments at the lodge last year. I, I just mainly mainly played cash there, but this year I'm going to be playing a lot more lodge tournaments. In fact, the lodge championship series is coming up in May, and uh, that's going to be awesome. April 26th through May 16th, so I'll be firing quite a bit at that time. And that's that's mostly it. We've got. Uh, you see on the WPT cruise, for instance, I played one tournament for $500 and that was comped. So um, that doesn't go in there as a loss because this is what I use for my tax records. And that's really it, guys. Uh, hope you enjoyed going through my stats. It's awesome to have my best year ever. And a lot of that is because of the coaching that I got from Nick Petrangelo uh, for the Smash Live cash course that I have a link down below in the description box for. And um, it's just been really cool to play these tournaments. You know, I, I, I ran really well and um, I don't anticipate that necessarily happening in 2023. And uh, I'm not sure if I'll go through my stats again in the future, to be honest. I've, I've gone through my worst year ever and now my best year ever. I'm going to be playing some huge games and... My, my entire year might be determined by how I do over the course of just a few sessions during this Lodge Champion, or sorry, this Lodge uh, relaunch um, week in February. So be sure to watch that. Anyway, hope you're all doing well. Hope you're staying safe. Good luck at the tables. I'll see you next time.